Hey everyone, my name is Tegan and welcome back to Sandy Writes. I've been reflecting on what I've read so far this year and I want to spend a little more time talking about my favourite reads of the year so far and collect those thoughts in one place. My favourite read from January was Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher. As the shy convent raised their born daughter, Mara escaped the traditional fate of princesses, being married away for the sake of an uncaring throne. But her sister wasn't so fortunate, and after years of silence, Mara finally realised that no one was coming to their rescue, no one except for Mara herself. On her quest, Mara is joined by the Grave Witch, a reluctant fairy godmother, a strapping former knight, and a chicken possessed by a demon. Together, the five of them intend to be the hand that closes around the prince's throat and frees Mara's family and their kingdom from its tyrannous ruler at last. There are so many elements here that make me feel like this book was written for me specifically, including this being a quest fantasy with a found family element, and also being fairy tale esque It plays with fairy tales in a way where we have the comfort and cosiness of a story with a dark thread running throughout it. I think that tonal dissonance might be off-putting for some readers, but I think the darkness is well woven with the cosiness, and I greatly enjoyed reading it. It's one of my favourite ways to see fairy tales explored. It's also not a retelling in any way that I can tell, just heavy on the fairy tale vibes. The imagery and the setting were immaculately described, and the tone in places was almost blunt and very to the point, which was quite refreshing. This is my first T. Kingfisher read, and I'm already deeply in love with her fantasy work and how unique the worlds are. My favourite from February was A Study in Drowning. Effie is studying architecture, but her true passion lies in literature and one book in particular. Angerad is a piece of folklore literature that's considered a modern day classic in this world. It is the one piece of media that Effie feels entirely seen by. The author of Angerad passed away a few months before the start of the book, and Effie receives a mysterious letter inviting her to help redesign the late author's manor after she won a contest. Obviously, she has to go. This guy is her favourite author, and this is her favourite book. But when she gets there, she discovers that the manor is crumbling into the sea. It is not fit to be restored by a first-year architecture student, and there's another kid there named Preston from the Literature College who is intent on proving that Angerad is not written by the person that we think it is. I think the character of Effie was resonating with a lot of people. She's like other Avery characters I've read in the sense that she's an outsider to society and within her own life. She's not like other young adult protagonists, and I don't mean that in a derogatory, not like other girls way but she's not snarky, she's not witty. I wouldn't call her very strong or necessarily very brave, but I would call her a survivor. The strong writing style and these characterizations are what contribute to what I think is the strongest part of this book, which is the thematic elements of it. It is impressive how much Ave Reed was able to cover thematically with a relatively short book. This is a book about how men take advantage of women, how particularly academic systems will not change unless they are pushed and forced to change, and how people will endure difficult situations, even if they get worse over time because it's all they know and they don't see a way out. It is often a dark book, but I think it's a very rewarding one. This may be cheating because the book isn't officially released until October this year or early next year for the UK, but my advanced copy of Don't Let the Forest In was my favourite read in much. High school senior Andrew takes refuge in the twisted fairy tales that he writes with the only person who can ground him to reality, Thomas, his best friend who turns his stories into whimsically macabre art. And with his twin sister Dove inexplicably keeping him at a cold distance upon their return to boarding school, Andrew finds himself leaning on his friend even more, but something strange is going on with Thomas. His abusive parents have mysteriously vanished and he arrives at school with blood on his sleeve. Thomas is haunted by something. Desperate to figure out what's wrong with his friend, Andrew follows Thomas into the off-limits forest one night and catches him fighting a nightmarish monster. Thomas Robin succumbed to life and are killing anyone close to him. To make sure no one else dies, the boys battle monsters every night, but as their obsession with each other grows stronger, so do the monsters, and Andrew begins to fear the only way to stop the creatures might be to destroy their creator. Drews has a gorgeous writing style. The prose is beautiful, which I already knew as an avid lover of their other works, and I'd absolutely be willing to try another book by this author with these horror influences just because of that. This book is hugely atmospheric and dreamlike, or nightmarish, with hauntingly beautiful imagery that I have taken infinite screenshots of so I can read my favourite lines over and over again. The spectrum of representation in the story is refreshing and touches on themes of identity, mental health and disordered eating. These are not easy topics to discuss with equal parts honesty and sensitivity, but they are important to talk about, especially for the young adult target audience. April was a dip into some indie reads and Jungle 7 by Olive J. Kelly came out victorious. Castor is a junker, a bounty hunter making a living off collecting and selling valuable scrub. They live a quiet life, bouncing from job to job, and not worrying about the brewing galactic rebellion. Except when they get a job offer for an irresistible amount of money, they find themselves embroiled much deeper than expected. 
They're tasked to smuggle transgender activist Juno Marcus across the galaxy under the watchful eye of the intergalactic police force and propaganda filmed in Galaxy. It's too dangerous to accept but too valuable to refuse and it doesn't help that Juno herself is charming and beautiful. Agreeing drags Cass into a whirlwind race against those who want Juno dead to make it across the galaxy to safety, risking it all for a cause they can't or won't believe in. Junker 7 was a book that, under most circumstances, I probably wouldn't have picked up with eagerness because it's science fiction, a genre that I don't usually fray into except under extremely specific circumstances. It's a romantic queer sci-fi epic about changing the galaxy one girl at a time, and honestly I picked it up because I was a judge for the Indie Ink Awards when this book was a nominee, and it won't stop consuming my social media feeds. And I'm glad I did pick it up because it was wonderful. It's set in space, it's T for T, there's a sapphic yearning, it has an autistic and disabled main character, it's perfect. Icarus was my first read in May and remained my favourite throughout the month. Icarus Gallagher is a thief, he steals priceless art and replaces it with his father's impeccable forgeries. For years the wealthy Mr Black has been their target, revenge for his role in the death of Icarus's mother. To keep their secret, Icarus adheres to his own strict rules to keep people and feelings at bay. Don't let anyone close, don't let anyone touch you, and above all, don't get caught. Until one night, he does. Not by Mr Black, but by his mysterious son, Helios, now living under house arrest in the Black Mansion. Instead of turning Icarus in, Helios bargains for a friendship that breaks every single one of Icarus's rules. As reluctance and distrust become closeness and something more, they uncover the bars of the gilded cage that has trapped both their families for years. Icarus is determined to escape, but his father's thirst for revenge shows no sign of fading, and soon it may force Icarus to choose the escape he's dreamed of or the boy he's come to love. Ultimately, Icarus is a book about opening yourself up to weakness and vulnerability. There are so many books written about the weak learn to be strong, and less so about how hardening yourself to survive has a cost, and the bravery of beginning to remove that protection and allowing yourself to grow. But this one is a love letter to the value of emotional intimacy and human connection, as all Ancron books are, and it never gets less heart-wrenching to read about. Dear Wendy was my favourite in June, and it's a book I knew I would be in love with from the moment it was announced. Despite knowing she'll never fall in love, Sophie enjoys running Dear Wendy, an Instagram account that offers relationship advice to students at Wellesley. When Joe, also a first year student at Wellesley, created their Sincerely Wonder account, it wasn't at all meant to be serious or take off like it does, not like Dear Wendy's. But now they might have a rivalry of sorts. While tensions are rising online, Sophie and Joe are getting closer in real life, bonding over their shared Arrow Ace identities. As their friendship develops and they work together to start a campus organisation for Aspex students, can their growing bond survive if they learn just who's behind the Wendy and Wanda accounts? Dear Wendy is the platonic love story of my dreams. I'm always searching for more contemporary stories that explore the nuances and complexities of being Arrow Ace, and this is certainly it. This book is a platonic comedy with an exploration of ace book identities and college life and teenagery feelings, and is ultimately a love story about two people who are not and will not be in love. I love that while Sophie and Joe are both settled in their identities, and this is a book about being arrow ace rather than discovering asexuality, they still had societal pressure induced insecurities and anxieties. It felt like a piece of my own life had been put onto the page. So these are my favourite reads of the year so far. If you've read any of these and have opinions or if you want to gush about your own favourite books let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching this video and I hope to see you next time. Bye!